This is RSBNB Update, episode 636, recorded Thursday, September 14th, 2017, The Calm Before the Storm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to RSBNB Update. This week, Dave and myself are here, as we have been for the uh, first week in September thus far. Welcome back. I have returned. So this week is the Witch's House Update, among other tiny little things. But that is not to say that we'll just be talking about the Witch's House and moving on to questions. Uh, Jagex did bring us some other content this week to discuss and some stuff that um, we need to have some reflection on, I think. Um, so hopefully we won't uh, make any of you guys too terribly sad during double XP weekend since that is it's, that is uh, starting as you guys are listening to this. And We will be trying our best to keep you entertained. Yeah. And I, I just want to say that if everything goes as to plan, I hope to have this episode out by the time double XP weekend starts. Just as a little bit of a treat to everyone out there so you're not waiting. Um, well, there you go. For half Early the, listening half the for your games. Friday. Yeah. Yep. So... And anyways, we're also doing a little bit of a test this week with uh, Discord compared to Skype, uh, just because we had some connection issues last week. I don't know if uh, the listeners would have realized that, but uh, we did, and uh, we'll see if this uh, works better for us given your ISP. So Indeed. Yep. Hope for the best. All right. So Witch's House is, of course, a, um, a classic old quest that... Uh, you know, is is one that uh, was at the bottom of the quest list and the members' quest list for so long, and you know it. It really feels like an inconsequential quest when you put it up there compared to everything else and all the other um, major storylines that are there. But you know, Jagex has been looking at free to play as we've seen in the recent months and the uh, streams and whatnot about uh, what's uh, going forward, and rightly so with the focus on mobile. So this week we have the graphical update towards the Witch's House and a bit of a cleaning of the Witch's House quest itself. Um, It's not replayable, so I didn't go play it. I didn't have the time to go make a new account to uh, go have a look with this. But nonetheless, um, they have streamlined the quest a bit and they gave the entire area a nice graphical rework and brought it up to modern uh, RuneScape NXT graphical standards, which I think at this point is something that um, you definitely want to see happen in the main game area, um, particularly somewhere close to the tutorial area of Taverly with everyone coming in. So this is just, uh, um, of course, uh, to the west of Falador, and you can get there with the shortcut or just uh, south of Taverly. And, you know, it, it it looks great. There's lots of great detailing of what's actually going on inside the house itself, aside from the updated hedges and ground textures. So I would just recommend everyone actually to go there and have a look at it with the uh, free cam option and, you know, just see what kind of great textures there are. Because you can't actually go in the building if you uh, have if you have completed the quest. It, that house is locked uh, for you. But as you move through it, um, you can see that there's a bearskin rug on the ground that uh, looks incredibly detailed uh, compared to how it was before. Also a fire in there. And, you know, with NXT, every kind of environmental texture, fire, water, whatnot, it all resonates so great with uh, the environment. So, um Really good. And on the opposite end of the yard, there's the um, little area with the barrel of logs and uh, the crates where you can see um, something ominous looking in there, cracks on the walls. And I mean, this is the quintessential area of what we um, have seen NXT come to be known for, you know, little odds and ends around the game that you might see a very high, highly close up screenshot of, but you might not know where it is. So uh, lots of fun little stuff like that. 
And also, you can zoom in really, really close. And what would have been just a little scribble of red before, if you zoom in all the way up to the fountain in the house area, you can actually see a Zamorak insignia on the on the fountain, which, of course, foreshadows to uh, what the quest can lead into. So, overall, Witch's House, uh, superb in terms of graphical reworks for um, NXT as well. So... I would highly recommend everyone go and give this a look. I don't think there's much else to say about it unless there's anything you'd like to bring up at this point about Witch's House or graphical rework. Um, no, not really. I mean, you'll hear this from me uh, plenty of times. Um, I'm always happy to see them start reworking the free-to-play stuff, bringing everything up to date, uh, because in recent terms, obviously, that means that they are, in fact, uh, working on our RS Mobile. Uh, we know that's not just a pipe dream, as it may have been in the past. Um, so I'm I'm glad to see that they're committed to making free to play and bringing it up to uh, standards for the actual free to play community. So it's always got the vote in my book. Yeah, and I I mean I, I think everyone who had doubts about NXT or can't run NXT, you just got to have a look at the at, at what's here. You know, um, we do have a video version of the show at youtubecom slash staff. There should be a video playing of the preview of the witch's house right now about how it looks. So just, you know, go have a look. Uh, don't mind my jerky camera quality, but, uh, <laughs> um, ha- have a look at what NXT has on offer. Definitely one of the biggest, uh, areas of improvement that we've seen, uh, NXT graphical wise in such a small f- factor for biggest bang for buck. I want to say so. Absolutely. All right. Um, obviously also been made free to play. So that is great. So, um, and, you know, I, I'm going to say this just before we move on, that I think small quests like this and specifically making those free to play is great. Because if you think about it, you're going to be playing on mobile. If you're bringing someone in who is playing free to play for the first time, they're not, they're not going to want to un- undergo an hour long epic quest to no. uh, play on mobile. They're going to want something that's quick, something that gives them the idea of RuneScape. And this does it. This does it just great. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think I was reading something where, you know, the average uh, attention span is maybe 20 seconds with mobile games. Uh, and I feel like that number is only getting smaller um, just with all the mobile games that are out there, you know, all the puzzle games and the, the candy crushes and all, you know, whatnot. So I think uh, they're doing their best to sort of compress, but yet enrich the uh, free to play experience for when that platform launches, because that has a uh, huge potential in terms of marketing and sales and whatnot. So. All right. Hopefully we'll hear more about that next week at RuneFest, you know, what the mobile strategy is. Because they're opening up the opening up the session with mobile, so that, that's got to say something. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to our patch notes right now for this week. Um, a number of interesting ones, and this is something players have wanted for a long time. Players can now change their skyboxes and filters in Dungeoneering, the Uncharted Isles, and their player-owned house. Previously, this wasn't possible um, because those are instanced areas, and uh, this is something that people wanted when they brought out the new free cam option with skybox filters. So you can now do this, and you can now, I don't know, maybe create some kind of epic movie on the Ark Islands. (laughs) So uh, there's that. Also, opening up uh, more areas of the game, Iron Man can now participate in the Flash Powder Factory minigame, but they cannot buy the XP rewards, which makes sense. Viking beer now counts towards the open bar achievement. Kegs still do not count. Uh, the open bar achievement, of course, is the one that requires you to bring uh, 28 uh, ales to the drunken dwarf. Which we were just talking about last Yeah, episode. we did. And, you know, that's one of the neat little odd achievements. So um, definitely nice to see I, these uh, getting some focus. I think, I think someone's listening. <laughs> No, I don't think someone is listening. I think someone no. is just watching that we're here. But oh, anyways. That's, that's true. Um, inspecting a player's favorite achievement now works correctly. Um, you'll remember that when the achievement system came out, uh, the revamp of it, one of the problems was you could favorite achievements. You could favorite your um, 99 farming, for example, but it would just say it was a favorite achievement and you wouldn't be able to jump to it. So now you can directly click those and jump to the achievements properly. Um, the next logical expansion for this, I think, would be uh, the ability to have other people be able to inspect your favorite achievements. So if I come up to you, I can see what your favorite achievements are and uh, just see where they, what you've been doing with them. So 
uh, and I, th I think that's a good logical step for the examine interface. So, following this, uh, they have made some changes to the living wyverns. Now, have you ever fought these? Uh, not enough to remember it. So I probably did a couple just for Slayer to try them out, but okay. I don't recall ever doing them on a normal basis. No. All right. So these are the NPCs. I know the mechanics, though. So yeah. I can relate. They came out in 2015, November 2015, as part of Slayer Month. And, you know, they, this was the first kind of experiment with Slayer and determining if we can do these kind of mini boss creatures for Slayer. And, you know, in general, they had a mixed reception ranging from okay for these to being absolutely painful for the uh, Ripper Demons. So they have, in effect, nerfed these down when I think based on our experience here with the achievements is that these were really unique mechanics and they weren't necessarily annoying and they didn't um, and they didn't require you to have a good connection like the Ripper Demons did. So here's what they've done to them. The radius of the fire's warming effect has been increased from one tile to two. So basically, there are fires inside of the of the living wyvern cave that you can go to to heat up. And when you warm yourself up with these fires, um, it diminishes the effect that the boss has on you, if I remember correctly, right? Correct. The negative yep. effect, yeah. Um, the fire is also now four times more effective, so you don't need to stay there for as long, which... I mean, it was okay. You, you, you had to be kind of on your toes about when it was time to move out and whatnot, but we, we might be able to live with this one. Uh, the environmental freezing effect now takes twice as long to build stacks. So what we're seeing here is we're effectively, I'm going to say that we're making these about eight times easier mechanically because it takes twice as long to build stacks, but fires are also now four times as effective, right? Right, yeah, they're on both sides It kind of exponentially increases exactly and the wyvern's attack speed has also uh been reduced see i don't know if it, that was necessary for these i i mean i realize that we want to try and keep these to a point where people are experiencing them and actually want to fight them but at the same time it, it, they were kind of unique so i'm on the fence if this was required what do you think do you think they were too easy or I don't think they were too easy, but I think they kind of went over the edge in sort of trying to bring them back um, as to where three of these four key points are all about basically nerfing them. Um, like you said, you know, fire four times more effective. I mean, you kind of have to pick one of the three. Otherwise, it just gets kind of out of control really quick. And these are probably soon going to become a pretty AFK able task at this point. So, yeah, we'll have to see on that. Um and, you know, they do have some really interesting drops, uh, mainly the Wyvern Bones. Those are good for our XP, um, as they are, you know, if you were to use them at a Gilded Altar, you'd get 175 XP with them. Um, they also have the ability to drop uh, the Wyvern Crossbow, which still goes for 17 million GP. So there is a reason to fight these. Um I don't know if this will bring more people to them, but hey, I mean, that's a tier 85 crossbow, right? Yeah, absolutely. Two-handed crossbow, yep. which when you think about it, compare that to a knock, to a knock, uh, a knock, or a, a knock bow, um, mm -hmm. 17 mil versus 100 mil for something that's tier 85 versus tier 90. Right, yeah, exactly. The amount of DPS difference you're going to get between these is, is is kind of small in the grand scheme of things, unless you're min-maxing uh, the right. amount of damage you're putting out. So, I mean, this might see the price of the Wyvern crossbow go down, which I ultimately think is good because if, if you talk to people after NXT came out, there's very little reason to choose anything other than the best, even if you're um, max level and ranged, say. So I am happy about that. that there's going to be a, another look at this. Yeah. Um, another thing that I think couldn't be exploited, and when I say exploited, I'm going to say exploited in a good way with these, is that um, these have uh, five crushed nests as a common drop, five noted crushed nests. Now, I'm not really a fan of having nests and whatnot drop in um, in combat situations, but while it's here use it so yeah 
Um, I mean, exactly. I might actually take a trip to these uh, after Double XP Weekend, or maybe even during Double XP Weekend, throw some throw some um, gizmos on a crossbow and go there because I do need um, I do need to get ninety nine ranged at some point. Well, there you go. There's your shot. Oh no, never mind. They are weak to magic. Whoops, a doozy. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> so, oh well, it'd still be fun to fight. I think. Oh sure. All right, so there's a little mini update inside the patch notes, and of course, that's why we like going through these. Um, they have also made the Six Age Circuit now be able to teleport to Memorial of Gothic. Six Age Circuit is what you get for completing uh, the World Wakes, so that can go to Memorial of Gothic, which was the first update of this year. And when you think about it, that's good, because previously, the best way of getting there was the uh, Eagle Peak uh, Lodestone. Yeah, I think that's more. I think this is more than appropriate update, especially for the six age circuit. So, yeah. uh, the bleed and darkness effect from the shadows on path three of Araxor will now clear at the end of phase two. It's a little bit of a bug with the Araxor fight there. Along with this, they have also increased the spawn rate of Araxor spiders. I don't remember what they were at before, but I'm guessing this is just to provide a more fluid combat experience. And I think that's uh, definitely one of the things I can touch on is that when I fought Araxor the couple times I did, um, it did feel as though there was a bit of a waiting period. So Yeah. They also added bank pin protection for, for when attempting to deploy or destroy a completion escape, which makes sense because if I recall, the completion escape can eat other capes in to get their effects. So. Correct. Uh, yep. you, you don't want to throw all that money away. No. A debuff icon has been added for when being frozen by a Skeletor Wyvern. Nice. And see, we didn't have the capability to do this before, and this is another thing that makes Wyverns nice and easy. So, yep. excellent. Uh, the clan job title of Ancienter has been replaced with Alternate Account. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why they would say Ancienter. I'm guessing that that is to mean for the... Um, ancient weapons types, perhaps? I think it's more of a um, seniority deal. Oh, maybe. Yeah, I like can... someone who's been around a while. It's, yeah. they, they just, I think maybe it's a joke to alternate account. You know, it's like, okay, you kind of reset yourself there. Yeah. I don't know. That's that's what I take away from it. All right. Fair enough. Uh, some other clan updates this week. Little clan updates snuck into the... Uh, into the into the patch notes this week, which was amazing. Uh, a clan broadcast message can now be toggled. That'll display the name of whoever is admin plus if they disallow or allow guests to, d to talk in the clan chat channel. Nice to have that as a toggle since sometimes we make these changes and we don't want to advertise them. <laughs> Clans in general want to do that. Visiting the clan Citadel uh, for the first time each week will now send an adventurer's log update and along with this, an adventurer's log update will now be triggered when capping at a clad citadel. So previously, um, what used to happen with this, if you wanted to see what someone had been doing for their clan work, is that you had to be on the same world as them, and then you would inspect their name in the clan list to see if they uh, had done any kind of clan citadel work for the uh, uh, past week. So I know this is something some clans will be looking at. Uh, I know in Clan Quest, our policy is is that um, we would appreciate it if you work the Citadel, but it's not something that is required to maintain membership. So we're not uh, we're not really anal about that. So. Along with this, um, on quests, uh, they have added a uh, change to the legacy interface mode for the questing icon. If you click on that, it'll now open the expected quest child window rather than the larger parent window, which is, I think, someone something someone will want because um, f for how long can you imagine that we have been having this quest window appear and people have been expecting it to appear like the old-fashioned RS2 kind of uh, quest list, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So, I actually like the legacy UI, I'm not going to lie, uh, sometimes. No, I, I didn't have a problem with it yeah. at all. I mean um, and, and, you know, I, I find it easier to read sometimes as well, the brown rather than the uh, blue. So, yeah, no, I agree. Um, also with this, uh, the buy limit has been increased from 100 to 1000 for bronze to adamant weaponry armor to allow better synergizing with invention. 
which is good, I think, because, um, you know, when you're disassembling swords and whatnot, you are going to need a good amount of them. And adamant ones, if I recall, maybe mithril ones too, are pretty efficient compared to the price of rune for getting components and whatnot. So uh, it's about time this uh, change has been made. So right on with this. Yep. Now here's one that goes back a long time, something that perhaps could have been annoying with this. Um, If you are eating a pie, a cake, or a pizza, they will now stay in the same inventory slot while consumed instead of jumping to the first free slot at each stage of eating. (laughs) So... While this wasn't ever really an issue to me, I think it's funny because I think everybody listening uh, remembers those days, uh, at least anyone that was in the PK scene. So oh, I think yeah, it's funny absolutely. that kind of just getting down to it now. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, going into the wilderness with cake or whatnot to, um, do, an old <laughs> make fashion, break in those to do an old-fashioned level three clue, even though you really, you really don't get sent into the wilderness anymore for clues. So No, not really. Um, nice to see this. Now, here's something that has always annoyed me when doing Slayer in Curadel's dungeon. Ferocious rings now have a loot beam value of 50k GP. I don't know what they were at before, but those rings would always trigger the loot beam, which I oh, found yeah. really I, annoying. I, I saw this 50k and I was wondering, oh my god, you know, because, you know, if it's, no matter what it is, nothing else is lighting up, but it was just right on the cusp of uh, always lighting up, and it always got my uh, my hopes up when I was fighting Abbey Demons. So yeah, Absolutely. It is what it is. Absolutely. Same thing. Because when you see a loot beam, you want something to be good. You don't want there to be you know, a, a uh, yeah. little ring that provides a very tiny damage boost. Post the 64th one you've put into your bank in the past year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, players can now use bamboo and golden bamboo to fletch turtle traps at level 96 fletching. Um, I haven't looked at this XP-wise, but it's going to be very interesting to see if this means that the arc might now be a good way to train fletching. Yeah, I found it odd that this wasn't a thing before. Right? So uh, I think uh, I think this weekend will prove and we might be able to see some emerging numbers on what these these rates could possibly be because i'm sure there's people right now furiously trying it out so now, we'll have to see um, no xp values but definitely uh would be something to look at here on double xp weekend with the arc Ooh. because these have been out for the beginning you just was able to buy them from the shop which was called torts or us i believe yeah um so, oh, hundred fletching XP. So, where does that put it in the chart? Let me just have a look here. One hundred fletching XP, and it's a one action, I assume. So, if we look at the fletching calculator, uh, what's our U longbow? Uh, our U short bow is one thirty-five, and U shield bow is one one fifty. So, it's I mean, it, it, it's not great, but it's an option. So. Yeah. All right. Scrimshaws of lower charge can now be combined to fully restore charge. For example, combining two three-hour superior scrimshaws will create one fully charged scrimshaw for four hours and one two-hour scrimshaw. So kind of the same way uh, combining potions and whatnot works. Yeah, I like that concept. It's nice. I'm glad they put that in. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it comes down to bank space and inventory management, right? And yeah, I think exactly. given given the fact we're not seeing the bank update for a while, um, there are other ways to band-aid that by focusing in on bank cleanup methodologies like this. So that works. Um, along with this, uh, degraded Goliath gloves can also now be combined together to restore charge in a similar way to the scrimshaws. So a uh, little bit of a focus around this uh, throughout the game. All right, now we're going to go into some technical NXT updates. Uh, They added support for FPS capping, and by default, your maximum FPS will now be set to 10 above your monitor's refresh rate. Uh, Most monitors, unless you have a more expensive or exotic one, are going to cap out at 60 FPS. And by default, your maximum FPS will now be set to 30 if RuneScape is not your focused window conserving power and GPU usage which is something a lot of other games do, and uh, it's nice to see them taking advantage of the NXT client for this. So 
some of you might have questions out there. Um, what's the difference between an FPS cap and V-Sync? Um, do you use V-Sync in RS or any of your other games? I don't believe so, no. Okay. So basically what V-Sync does is it's short for vertical sync. And this means that the game and the graphics card through through linkage and correlation are in effect going to wait to send the data to the monitor until your monitor's refresh rate is capable of displaying it. Because what will happen is if your GPU is sending data too quick, you can get what's called screen tearing, where it looks like you're getting a bit of distortion on the screen because the GPU is working too fast for your for your monitor. Now, you know, these will be little, little artifacts, and they kind of look like a little bit of a squiggly line that appears at some point on the screen. So if you don't see any kind of distortions or squiggly lines like that, you probably don't need V-Sync. But if you want to use FPS capping, which will just cap the FPS from sending it at a, at a too high of a rate, rather than uh, the opposite of what V-Sync does, which in turn is holding it back to wait and draw it so it doesn't create those artifacts. Um, FPS capping is really just useful for ensuring that your GPU or CPU doesn't work too hard, and it'll just send the frames whenever they're ready. So uh, there's a bit of a, a bit more thought behind V-Sync, whereas FPS capping just says no more than 60 or 70 FPS for this uh, this device because... Um, we don't need to be expecting that much usage here. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if that'll be an option to, uh, toggle on or not. I know it, I know it is kind of fun seeing sometimes RuneScape tick up to 120 frames per second in the <laughs> FPS counter. <laughs> yeah. It always, uh, it always makes me smile. That's for sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have noticed this before and I did this when I had a louder GPU is that, um, I would just turn VSync on for RuneScape because I didn't want my GPU fan to kick in all the time when I was playing. So I would just use VSync in, in instead of FPS capping, even though I didn't need VSync enabled here because I wasn't having the screen artifacting. So, uh, in a nutshell, if you see artifacting on your screen, you want VSync, and if you just want to give your GPU or CPU a break, that's when you want FPS capping, and VSync is caused by uh, the graphics card sending data too quick to the monitor to have it draw it out. So um, that's pretty much all we got for the patch notes this week, unless there's anything else you'd like to bring up. Nope, that pretty much covers it. Alrighty. So this weekend is double XP weekend, and we have been told that Invention Batch 2 is coming out uh, this coming Monday on the 18th of September. Now, along with this, they're bringing new blueprints for all the devices out there. So the thing is, okay, maybe we should just uh, why why are we doing this right after Double XP weekend when people could be when people could be getting Double XP on them? Well, Jagex is going to be very nice to the community. Uh, they're extending the fifty percent XP boost for Blueprint Discovery for two weeks following the in- release of Invention Batch Two. Um, there's a good note here with this that other invention training methods will not be boosted after Double XP weekend ends. And it's also worth noting with this that you only get the plus 50% XP boost for invention because it is an elite skill. So um, if you see you're only getting 50% XP on double XP weekend, that's why nothing is wrong. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they did this because, I mean, who knows how many devices we're going to get and whatnot. And it's going to be uh, spending a lot of time figuring out what's in this new batch. So Yeah, I, I always like it when they sort of extend the... Uh the festivities of the weekend, at least mm-hmm. out another week for people that can't, you know, absolutely be on, on that day. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Especially with a, a big release such as this, um, you know, kind of just right there after, uh, after the weekend. So I'm glad they're extending that. Yeah. And, um, basically, um, the idea behind this is so that, you know, just do what you want on double XP weekend invention wise. Don't worry about waiting. Don't worry about inspiration. Cause that's going away. And, uh, unlock the blueprints right away don't hoard them because that's what people do now for double xp weekend so in fact yeah. i'm doing that for double xp <laughs> so all right so we're gonna move on and discuss the discuss the unfinished business stream that happened this week so before we get too far on this path 
Um, I'm just going to elevate one point since we were just talking about it. During the stream, they did talk about Invention Batch 2. And that is still on course for next week on the 18th. And here's a bit of a rundown of what we're going to be seeing with this. Five new machines, each with two ranks, starting at level 60. 13 new devices, which includes the spring cleaner, the portable fairy ring, and so on. They have redone the level 120 emote. Augmenters and junk refiners are becoming tradable. Cogs will be toggleable on your weapons. You're going to be getting the blueprint bonus that we just talked about. The 11, level 11 plus gear bonus, including reduced drain rate and increased proc chance and the removal of inspiration. And they did say there were some other things that were thrown in here that were not talked about yet. So it's going to be a huge release on Monday for Invention. And it's kind of like a reboot or um, at least the sense I got that that's what they're aiming for with the skill. So um, you excited for this? Invention Batch Invention- 2? Yeah, I mean, Invention Bash 2, I, you know, I I think I stand with a lot of people in saying that I kind of just wish it would all come out at once, but it is what it is. I'm glad to see they're following up on it. Um, but yeah, I, re- I really like the idea of the machines, um, devices, and especially, um, you know, adding more significance to um, 11 or 12 plus gear, you know, rather than just sort of being empty. I'm glad they're filling out the skill a little bit more, so. Yeah, definitely. All right. So what else did they talk about this week? Well, uh, they talked about Menis- Metaphos Amnesty, which was, a, which was a topic of intense debate when it came out. And Maud Osborne said, you know, they probably wouldn't do something like this again just because there was a mixed feeling about it. And, I mean, they're not going to be batching content that's this huge before. That's going to be affecting comp and trim. So Amnesty right. or something similar to it won't be happening. Um, now comes to one that's going to break a lot of people's hearts probably, and that's quest replayability. They said it was tough, tough to do, and it doesn't seem worthwhile to make quests replayable. When the vampire quest finale was being worked on and developed, and the beta worlds were activated for replays, take a guess at how many people actually did that, apparently. Probably less than ten. It was actually eight. I mean... (laughs) Oh my god! <laughs> and I think I know two or three of them myself. So right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, I I'm glad they're taking. I think Colton the was one of them, and I think there might have been <laughs> two others in Clan Quest, maybe more. But that's how it worked. Oh my goodness. Um. So yeah, we likely won't be seeing something like that in the future. Now comes to the point of this stream that everyone was waiting to hear about and that's the mining and smithing pool now we're going to have some reflection here on this so Maud Osborne said he's fairly happy with the way the poll went forward the fact people voted no and the poll was done based off of the feedback that they saw in the survey because if you'll recall that survey people voted said that the high level content in the skill was more important than rebalancing out the lower end of it (laughs) So JX took this as, oh, maybe we should just create the high-level stuff and use that as a bit of a stopgap. Um, and there are also questions, of course, regarding the big reward at the end of smith at the end of the smithing skill, how you'll make money with it, and other questions that uh, did come up during this process. And all of these will be polled with uh, with a survey type question. What's the polling system is reworked on the website? And they also did say that a big mining and smithing announcement will be coming at RuneFest. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what's with that. But I'm betting it'll be in the RS Reveals section. So we'll definitely have our ear out for that. Um, how do you feel about Osborne saying that they're happy with the way the poll went forward? Uh, I think they're just trying to sidestep the inevitable. Um, I think it definitely obviously needs work. Um, yeah. I would just would have sort of liked to see him at least take a little bit of... I don't want to say ownership, but a little bit more sort of just have more awareness of what happened and how it should be improved rather than saying, yeah, this was good. We're just going to kind of move on. So I don't know. We'll see. But yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it feels as though that there was a huge groundswell of no votes to begin with and then it tapered out. And I mean, I'm betting and I, and I did the, and I ran the numbers here and I don't know if I mentioned this last week on the show, um, on average, 
on average, there were only about 8,000 more votes in the mining and smithing vote than the last five of the polls that were running game in total. So only about 8,000 more. And yeah. I mean, based on statistics and whatnot, you cannot assume that all these people voted no. You cannot assume that these people all voted uh, – we're coming from old school as well, so you can't assume that. And, you know, just to play devil's advocate here for this, if you were to transfer all those no votes, the extra 8,000, assuming they were people coming in who, you know, were not stakeholders of the game, just assuming that were the case, I'm not saying it is, um, that would have only pushed the yes option up to 35%. So it would have taken no down by another four percentage points, which really isn't that much. So... Um, it, it, the verdict was set by the core community who votes on this. Um, rather than going to what was talked about next in the stream, I'm going to skip over one and talk to the talk about the poll system. And then we'll come back to the bank rework um, because they actually did address the poll system here and they ex addressed it quite a lot. And they said it worked fine for, you know, about the first couple of polls they did or give or take a week. But it really wasn't used properly after that first invention versus uh, Prif poll that they did way back when. Um, I think we all remember that one. And um, I, I think that was a relatively close poll, too. Wasn't that 51-49? Yeah, if, if not, it was maybe a couple more percent spread. But yeah, I remember that being neck and neck for just about the entire duration. Yeah, and uh, and I mean, we, we got Prif, and I think that turned out quite well, um, given the fact that uh, it was an update that was polled, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just look and see if I can pull some numbers up on that because um, yeah, that was it. Invention versus the Elf City. So yeah, it was fifty fifty five forty five for the uh, Elf City. So um, not a complete runaway, but uh, definitely uh, definitely something there. So. All right. Um, along with the poll system, other things they said, uh, they're going to be reworking it because they want to do the surveys type stuff in game, maybe have runoffs. Uh, initially, they only wanted yes, no and A-B testing, but um, they want to offer more like what they had uh, in the summer survey so they can make uh, proper judgments from it, I guess would be the word to say here, which is good. Yeah. Because I, I don't know if you've ever worked much with data before, but if you have a bad set of data or you have a data sample set that is not representative, you might as well have not taken the survey to begin with. So Right. Yeah, absolutely. In this um, case, one bad apple really does spoil a bunch. So. Yeah. And, you know, this is like the same thing like opinion polling in real life when you're, um, you know, you see uh, this has a error rate of. 3.5% 19 times out of 20 because of the survey size and you factor right. that into population and whatnot. You can get a good idea, but in general, you're not going to capture what everyone feels. So it is better to have the more granular information on this. Um, they are also going to be outlining the best way to ask questions. Initially, they wanted to be more hands-off and let the teams create their own polls. And it has been realized that there needs to be more of a process with the creation of polls. Now, based on the discussions we've had on this podcast before and what we've talked about the last couple of weeks, do you think that this admission that they need an outlined way to ask these questions and ensure that they are being created properly, the polls are being created properly, do you think that's a win? Yes, absolutely. And I, if I recall correctly, I don't know if we said it on show or if it was pre-show, but you were talking about that as well, of how it should be a lot more structured, um, you know, try to eliminate as much conflict of interest as possible, really make it transparent, um, really sort of almost be like its own team to sort of develop this and, you know, be focused on the reception and actually getting that pure data that they're looking for and feedback rather than just sort of kind of throwing, you know, both options out there and kind of pushing and scooting everybody towards the option that they kind of prefer as we saw. Yeah. The and they so. just, and they, they addressed that too. They said, you know, we're not, we weren't trying to push an agenda in that poll. And um, even if it felt that way, that's not what was being, that was not what was happening. And we went through this before. It all comes down to the fact, the way yes and no were presented and they have outlined what they want to do with this to uh, 
kind of try and prevent that from happening in the future. And they outlined a four-step process for this. And the first one is an open discussion on the forums detailing the aspect of the development. And with that, they will outline of what they want to achieve, propose a few ideas, and then open it up for community discussion. So this is basically the huge planning phase here, or the pre-planning phase, whatever. They'll say, hey, we need to work on smithing. So this is what we want to achieve. This is what we need to do to do it. And here's how we might go about accomplishing it and then see what the community thinks about it. That's step one. Step two is to look at the ideas and feedback and actual uh, thoughts that were submitted on this and propose a solution in a developer blog format. And with this, the poll text would be included and it will be made clear about what happens if either side wins. And this is the time where poll text can be adjusted if need be. Um, you know, I think this is great. And I think this step is uh, definitely one of the key points here. Um, what I think is missing from this is that, you know, if the poll text is adjusted, it needs to be done based on, you know, not necessarily a vocal minority that is out there saying things and uh, shouting ideas from the bleachers about what's wrong with the poll. But that can be listened to, of course. But what should be happening here is that it should be looked at from a bias and ultimately sensationalism point of view. Because if the poll text is going to be biased or if the developer blog is too hyped towards one option, it is going to look as though um, one side is being biased towards the other. So um, I think that in addition, it should say here that poll text will be made as least biased as possible, which um, that's the sentiment people got from the mining and smithing poll. So hopefully that's a good learning experience going forward. And based on what I've seen here, I think it is so. And finally, the poll will go live, and it will be uh, published on the in-game system. Results will be monitored, and quote, if there's any indication of unforeseen issues that are corrupting the results, we'll rerun it. So, they can obviously monitor metrics of who's voting and uh, the kind of swells they're getting with this. So, I guess if they see something that is unexpected to be happening here, uh, they will rerun the poll. Um, unforeseen issues and key point there being corrupted the results. I'm happy with that. I think that that's a good point to start. Um, the only thing I would personally like to see added on to this would be a definition of what kind of corruption we're talking about. Is it, you know, a certain threshold or is a certain group of people manipulating the vote or is it certain people voting who are not supposed to vote or might not be able to render the, an appropriate decision on it? I think that's the kind of uh, question that I would ask regarding this. What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. But I can also understand how they might not want to sort of advertise that because then if the gets into the wrong hands, then they'll just circumvent that and just, you know, try to overload the system if they really want to by another means. So, I mean, it is what it is, but I, I completely 100% agree with you that, you know, I've always liked more specifics and data and information. So that's always uh, something that I look for. But in this situation, I don't really think it's warranted, I suppose. I don't know. All right. And finally, the last step is that a short dev blog post style post will be made um, that outlines the results and what the proposed next steps of action are uh, for this. So, um, and, and that's basically confirming that this happened and this is what we're going to be doing with it. So now um, along with this, they say runoffs, ranked updates, and uh, um, that kind of thing will be possible when the new polling system has been put out. So they are definitely going to be going with that survey option. Now, how does this relate to mining and smithing? I don't know. I think mining and smithing <laughs> was kind of the preview here. Um, they said that we'll be seeing a dev blog uh, soon. I don't know if it'll be next week, but it'll definitely be soon about what's happening with mining and smithing, maybe at RuneFest. But hey, I mean, um, we're going to figure out what's happening with this regardless. So they are fulfilling on step four here. So. Anything else about polls? No, I think we, uh, I think we covered most of our general sentiment about it. Yeah. So we'll just have to see going forward. Yeah. And I mean, 
I, I am cautiously optimistic that I can call this a win for the polling system uh-huh, and that yeah. we're not going to have too much negativity going forward with this. So fingers crossed on that front. Though I do still feel as though the community um, needs to just take a step back and realize what we're doing here and realize yeah. the position the community is in. So, All right. Um, the bank rework, re- resource allocation is still an issue on this project. The bank rework, they're classing as a technological project, so meaning that it's on the same page as something like RS Mobile or interface changes, and RuneScape Mobile will happen first. And one thing they said is that, you know, they're not getting money outright from RS Mobile, so it's not as though they're doing RS Mobile for the money. So I thought that was nice to hear, that they're just yeah. doing it for the sake of doing it, and they feel it's something the community needs. All right. Um, they did pull back in February the Grand Exchange booths. Uh, there was a poll to say, should we keep the Grand Exchange booths in Varrock as four? Or should we bring it down to one? Uh, one done. We have the prototypes now of how uh, this is looking in game. Um, I voted to keep it at four because, you know, it's such a huge area. And that fountain is a centerpiece. It's where Sliske's big sword was last year. Uh, I didn't really feel it made sense to keep it a, to move it down to one, but that's what the community wanted. So yeah, yeah um, no, I agree. I, I voted to keep it at four because it was uh, it was refreshing um, in the uh, the new game plant. Um, you know, it's sort of you you grew to love it because you are you always had every booth sort of theme. You know, there's always the bonfires and stuff in the southwest corner. Uh, you know, the northwest corner was typically the people that were just fresh out of war bands or just you know just quick bank you know whatever. Um, so it's a shame to see it go, but again, yeah. that's what the community wanted, so you can't argue with it. And so. Spirit Tree Banking, so close right there as well. Yeah, only a few steps exactly. away. So yep, um, I'm. Uh, I, I I wish we were keeping it at four, but it is what it is. Um, there are some clocks in this profile uh, screenshot here. I don't know what they're supposed to represent since you know there's no time. <laughs> uh, they did say it was kind of going to be like a bank that you would have in real life, how those banks would have clocks and whatnot showing the different time zones. But oh, right, I'm not yeah. exactly sure what they'd represent here in RuneScape. So. <laughs> um, we'll have to wait and see. Um, RuneFest RuneScape reveals everything that's going to be talked about in that segment at RuneFest is stuff that's going to be being worked on. So there's not going to be any long promises of things that might not make it into game in the next year because that's something people mentioned this year that, you know, we talked about lots, but hey, there wasn't much happening. So I think people will find that nice to hear. Aura bag work will resume once the poll system is reworked. So the aura bag is kind of on hold at the moment. And they want to get to a point where um, there's not going to be any more unfinished business streams and they'll get the unfinished projects down to a reasonable number. That unfinished business will simply be a moniker that runs around in-game where they can think of what can we do to reduce unfinished business with this update or make sure we're not actually creating um, any unfinished business. And they don't want to provide an actual list of unfinished business updates because that will just create too much uh, reliance and uh, hope from the community in that, you know, these things all need to be ticked off. And if they don't, it's going to be a huge letdown. So there's going to be no list for this. Right. And being the subject matter that it's pretty much at, you know, some point or another, it's going to be on sort of a rolling uh, time frame. So it's kind of kind of productive to sort of keep a list with everything right. going in and out because as you've seen, um, you know, pushing the bank rework back for RS Mobile. Some things do take priority, and it's sort of a rolling, uh, you know, get get the rolling cycle there. So it's kind of not very for for two different aspects points of view as to actually listing out what they need to fix. So. Yeah, and you know, I, I also think that um, you know we're getting to a point now post Metaphos where. September feels like the first month back of actual updates, actual meaningful updates. Um, Without them like plug in and promoting that sort of quote unquote expansion. Right. Yeah, no, and, I agree. And, you know, having small patch notes and whatnot. So, right. uh, I mean, if we keep this cadence and rhythm up, I think we'll get a good mix of old and new going forward. And we'll have to see what the theme is come RuneFest for 2018. Uh, quests were talked about. Evil Dave quest is still coming this year, but other quest announcements, that's being saved for RuneFest. 
Um, mining and smithing cost, the question was asked, how much does it cost and how large was it in terms of manpower? And the example they gave for this is that it's larger than Priftinus Batch 1, but not bigger than Priftinus Batch 1 and 2 combined. So, you know, they, they, it's going to be probably about I'm seven or eight months of work based on this. Then. So, which I think is fair. And, and that's a really efficient time scale when you're reworking two massive skills in game. So. Um, I, I think that was a good question to answer, and lots of people were wondering that. Uh, furthermore, Jagex said that they do do A-B testing with new types of tutorials and whatnot for the general public. So if you create a new account, you might see a different tutorial than someone else who's created a new, new account. They said, obviously, you don't hear this because not everyone who does the tutorial is going to go on the official forums or social media and post about, hey, I got a different tutorial here because they're not going to know because <laughs> they just started the game. So um, that does indeed happen. Daily Scape Productions, which is another huge thing for many of the players out there, um, it's slated next as one of the projects to begin development unlikely going to be a quick project since it touches so many areas in game and lots of dnds and it's entirely possible that uh, it'll come out in a rolling fashion since it affects so many distractions and diversions now here's something that people were wondering about uh for a long time a construction rework when is there going to be a construction rework <laughs> They have a couple JMONs looking at possibilities and prototypes for this, but it's largely being done as a tap project, so project being done in someone's free time. So nothing anytime soon on this file. Um, if you're wanting to submit seasonal high scores, they did mention that Mod Ryan has a uh, topic created on the official forums for the season seasonal high scores where they can uh, post uh, suggestions about what they'd like to see in the future. So if you have any, now's your time. Go post there. Link is in the show notes at update.rsbnb.com. Um, you have any suggestions while we're here right now? Uh, not for seasonal high scores. Um, I think that a lot of what we're about to cover sort of covers something that we were talking about last week, but I will save that for the next 10 seconds. All right. Uh, other potential high score ideas that have been submitted include a uh, number of clue scroll runs completed, attaining a certain amount of XP in a skill in one hour or some other time period, and who can complete the fastest farming run as some of the ideas. That one caught your eye. Yeah, it really did catch my eye. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What what I was about to say, though, was basically we had talked about this um, last show and how this is... I think it would be neat to have this sort of framework pegged to an achievement. You know, so, I mean, not to say that that's not what it is now, but, you know, with the, the clue score runs and the how many, um, you know, herbs can you get per farming run or a certain amount of XP in an hour or so many trees in an hour. Um, I like that as a high score, like a seasonal high score deal, but that also ties in with achievements to where I think achievements should start going. So we'll see where this takes us in the next. Oh, very good idea. Get an achievement for every 50 clue scrolls that you complete culminating with 500. Right. Exactly. And then maybe you kind can... of a kind of a kill count for the you know non PPMers right our right. Are, are, uh, silent majority yeah so. um, and I'm I'm just actually going to go back to that right now there is a question <laughs> <laughs> we 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 we, <laughs> we nearly gave people a heart attack last week with what you said <laughs> <laughs> they thought you were serious in that uh, <laughs> oh my gosh that I PB, need to in that I guess PBM I'm a people. And that PVM people thought they were getting it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I need to I need to calm down. With that. It was only when I started laughing that it set in, but still, it was a it was a shock. <laughs> Quite convincing, I suppose. And I, I know for a fact it made more than one or two of them stop <laughs> what they were doing and actually express some kind of anguish at you for that. <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta bring them back in. Gotta bring them back in. Can't let them drift. Gotta keep their attention. <laughs> keep them on your toes keep them on their toes yeah that, that's what it so just to be clear you were joking about that absolutely <laughs> okay. absolutely all right i figured that'd be a good time to mention that <laughs> all right and one final thing came from this stream and that's farming timers 
Um, apparently, Maud Easty looked at this because this was something that was pulled that people would like, but they would need to rewrite most of the farming code to accomplish it just because of the way farming works. On its own, it's not worth it, but they said if it were coupled with some kind of other farming rework that it might be worth doing it. And this is kind of just an example of how scatterbrained the polls were back then because they published a poll on doing farming timers when they didn't even know if it was technologically possible with what they had uh, to work with in the system right now. All right, yeah. So... Um, but you know, there are, there are good ways to, to do this and I could talk about it in a segment at the future at some point, but, um, as it stands right now, just as a quick example, herbs run on a 20 minute cycle and that cycle is determined based on when you log in. So with some timing and noting the clock of when you log into that world, it is entirely possible to kind of build your own herb farm timer, if that's what you're trying to do in your head. And that applies for all the other trees that are out there. So um, I've got it down to a point where I can do a herb run, log out, and know the exact time to log back in based on the time I logged out. Because the timers, the window for the timer is effectively reset whenever you log in or log out. So It'll run for a certain number of windows after you log out, and then after four cycles, it'll grow up and your herb will be ready to harvest. And that's why sometimes it feels as though it takes longer um, than the purported amount of time to grow something is because the timer got messed up from logging in and logging out too much. So just as a general, I guess, PSA to people doing farming runs on double XP weekend, you're going to have your farming time suffer if you're logging in and logging out a lot world hopping so keep that in mind if you're doing farming this weekend and that's a bit behind the scenes of how farming works and how the timing of aspect of it works so with a bit of practice you're actually able to create your own farming timers and that can be a topic for another show at some point so all right that's the unfinished business q a stream this week um, I don't think there's anything else to mention from it. I'm fairly happy with what I heard about the polling system. Um, like I said, there are a few questions left to go, but I think this is a good this is a good step forward from where we were at two weeks ago with this. So um I'm good to move on if you are. Yep, absolutely. Alrighty. So we're gonna move on to questions right now. Um our first question this week is a long one. It's from Tycho. <laughs> All right. So, hi, RSBNB. It took some time, but fear not, because free-to-play is now on its way to become a complete demo of the game. This is because Jagex are expecting a lot of new players with the launch of RS on mobile and wants to give them the best treatment possible. The most annoying paywalls are going to be removed, the areas are expanded, and even a whole skill is being released for the free players. Now, the question is, do you really think that RS on mobile will bring in new players? Personally, I don't think so. However, I strongly believe that we will see a massive increase in playtime by all current players, and there are four reasons to that. Treasure Hunter, Dailies, AFK on the go, and of course, the community. So Tycho goes on for a bit now, and he says, as we all know, um, who doesn't log in every single day for that chance to win 200 million GP on Treasure Hunter. Who hasn't lived in pain over the UK game time that always closes that Treasure Hunter promotion before you wake up or manage to get home after work? And who hasn't dreamed of buying even more keys before the promotion ends? All of this will soon be reality. I think Tycho here just did a really good advertisement for microtransactions. Yeah, there you go. That's what I got. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And in regards to the dailies, those things that we always finish but always return, no matter how hard you try for them not to, they're just like the Force in Star Wars, always around us, and affects every single living organism in the entire universe. Okay. I didn't know you were a Star (laughs) Wars fan. (laughs) To please this Force, you must literally work hand and your hard work will be rewarded even if it is watching 332 u logs burn in a bonfire in front of your eyes who hasn't been eager to invent a mechanical hand that clicks on buttons on your keyboard every 65 seconds 
when you could watch Game of Thrones instead. Some have brought a custom gaming mouse for $200 and solved it that way, but fear not, because the $200 saving solution will soon be here. In regards to AFK now, soon to be executed as a thing of the past, the AFP, away from phone, will enter the scene and be crowned king. Who hasn't felt the wrath of staying active when finishing or when fishing 50k fish of the, on the docks of Metaphos? <laughs> to quote my friend Luke, skilling while, act, while taking a dump. Hashtag the dream. <laughs> All right. Who who didn't wish that somebody else could woodcut those yew trees while while somewhere else? Who couldn't resist watching YouTube, Netflix, anime, or even the TV just behind the computer while the World Guardian demonstrates the true power of the Crystal Hatchet? Try to make that sound like a final boss fight. In the end, even Dora, Dora the Explorer on TV will win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the community God. now. Those things that never become satisfied no matter what you give them. Always screaming, balance this, rework that, don't steal our comp capes, and don't forget to give us a sailing skill. But we love them. Also, they love themselves, so the feeling is mutual. We tried telling them this wasn't a dating site, but that didn't work. But did that work? Pfft, of course not. They love dating. So why would we keep those poor e-daters away from each other? You are right. We shouldn't. But better do something about it, and the deadline will be in 2018, the mobile dating site on the go. <laughs> Thank you for the, all the amazing work, and see you all at RuneFest 2017. Okay. <laughs> Well, you can see where Tycho's coming from with this. He's uh, clearly thought out his four areas here. Um, and, you know, I, I think when you split it down to it, Tycho's got it. I mean, he did an impeccable advertisement for microtransactions. Dailies, I totally get. Um, AFK and TV, absolutely, because you don't always need a full computer for that. And the community definitely as well. So um, back to the question... Um, you know, I, I think Jagex is doing it for two reasons. They're obviously hoping to catch some of that, um, perhaps luck that if they get featured in one of the app stores where they can bring in a, um, you know, a selection of players every so often and have, have them stick around hopefully. So, you know, I, I think that if this is being marketed as a free app, the largest MMO in the world, which I don't know if it has that title, maybe that belongs to world of Warcraft. Someone can correct me on that, but I think, um, I, I think it's a great option to get this game in front of more faces, just like the mini clip deal was. And that's what I always come back to. And you guys might be wondering what the mini clip deal is. Well, back in 2005, when RS2 was still new, Jagex partnered with a website, miniclip.com, that was a gaming website, primarily flash games, and um, got their game on here and got mini clip out to tons of people in schools. And if you look at it, um, you see that, oh, everyone has uh, everyone has been coming here from Miniclip, and this is where everyone who was playing RS in school came from. So I'm personally hoping for another Miniclip-style effect, seeing RuneScape featured on the side of the App Store, even just in the gaming section of the App Store, which is a dedicated section now. But I think um, at the core of it, they are definitely going to be seeing more people uh, playing more often with RS than they are now. Um, and I mean, even that goes for me because, um, there are times where I just don't want to use the full computer for RS. It just doesn't make sense to do that sometimes. So I think this is going to be a good option going forward, but yeah, no, I agree. I, I'm not sure how many fresh new people they're going to bring in, but this shouldn't be underestimated either is that there's going to be plenty of people that have, played before oh i mean anybody that's ever played a video game pretty much is oh at least i've heard of runescape you know what i mean so even because of that mini clip um campaign you know they have at least seen it and you know sort of have an idea of what it is so if anything um i think it will be worth uh the the fact that people that have heard about it, it's like oh my gosh they actually have a mobile app now and they'll just try it out and see what it's all about so even if it's not brand new customers are still going to be bringing in tons of people that are looking for that sort of nostalgia um, in a game. So 
Yeah, I mean, it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to see a boatload of new people coming in. But hey, if that's the if that's the end option and the end result from this, then that's all the better. Um, right. I think what we do need to see and what we do need to ensure happens with this is we need to ensure that this is successful because um, you know you don't want Jagex to spend a spend a huge amount of time on this product and have only ten percent of the player base using it. Right. Exactly. Um, that just would not be worth it. So um, if that indeed happens, that it's that low, they're going to need to look and see whether it's from an interaction perspective or if it's just not as, as appealing as they thought it would be and adjust accordingly. But of course, that's putting the camel before the horse and uh, or camel before the cart and hoping that uh, we get pulled in the right direction and uh, and everything happens as per plan here. So uh, fingers crossed on all that. But um, definitely possible, but I don't, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. So No. Thank you, Tycho. And I'm sure everyone will have, uh, appreciate hearing uh, what you had to write about this. So, uh, really amusing. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, the next, next question is uh, from the RR man. Um, hey, hey, it's the RR man. Uh, last week you mentioned the quote-unquote runecrafting story and that someone should ask about it. So I'm asking, what is the story? Uh, this is the question, or is this a question for another show? Uh, so I think, I think we both oh, had a story here about runecrafting in the early days. Yeah, I mean, in the early days, it is what it is. Um, I kind of went over that last episode to kind of where I started, what got me into it, and uh, obviously the end result. But I think at least the story and borderline rant, uh, I guess, that we were talking about was the uh, the infamous 2009 uh, runecrafting curve um, update. And for those of you that don't know, uh, prior to this update, um, everything in terms of multiple runes uh, that you crafted per level, um, it was mm. a very linear, or I should say, sort of a it cutoff. Fixed. It was fixed, absolutely. So... For example, at level 90, you would only make one nature rune per craft, but at level 91, you would make two. It was just cut and dried. You would either get 27 or you get 54. Um, but with this update, it was it basically scaled. So um, at level 44, you are able to craft uh, nature runes, and all the way from 44 to 91, you would get a little bit extra. So, you know, the if you were, say, level 50... Um, instead of getting 27, you might get 29. I mean, you would get a little bit extra. So being that my main source of income, um, that severely um, cut into my uh, strategies in that regard. And needless to say, I'm still slightly bitter about it, but, you know, it is what it is. But that was the big sort of, I guess, story, considering that I spent uh, six months at uh, the ZMI altar and, the Earth Altar with Earth Runecrafting Gloves from Fist, Fist of Guthix, uh, when that was actually um, still, like, the the hot game to play before there was a such thing as a spotlight or whatever. Now I feel really old. Uh, but anyway, no, that was it. It was basically just kind of a dumpster fire uh, for me and my runecrafting um, sort of career. So that was my end of the story. I don't know if Shane has All anything right. different. Yeah, my story was about, um, was about runecraft running in general. And, um, how that was, what was happening there. Um, okay. That's gone. Um, but, um, you know, back in the day, RS2 came out, I believe it was March, uh, it was March, 2004. And, um, it was, uh, for all intents and purposes a RuneScape classic skill. Um, it was effectively the skill that came into RS2, but it felt like a, but it felt like a RuneScape classic skill because it was oh so slow. It was so slow. <laughs> um, and what happened with this is that um, when it came out through the, through that summer and the number of months and year or so that followed it, um, the ability to um, craft runes was something that you know took a lot of time because when you think about it um the i'm just going to start off lower and the chaos altar is in the middle, middle of the wilderness the cosmic altar is in the lost city the nature altar is in the middle of karamja and that's all we had at launch 
Later on, we had the law altar, which was added on Entrena, which which had its own set of problems because you can't wear stuff when you go there. Death altar, obviously, at the end of Morning's End Part Two, at the um, in the Temple of Light, uh, blood altar, vampire quest underneath some long labyrinth, and now soul altar in Menaphos. These rune crafting altars are in very, in very, uh, are in very obscure locations. So. The idea that was thought up by a number of people was what if we established a business about doing this where we could uh, get GP in the hands of people. Now, remember, this was 2004 and um, and RuneScape 2 had just come out a, a few months before, right? So yeah. it was still hard to get GP. This is when 400 GP was a lot. So when 50k GP was a lot. So what these people did who had the money to invest in it is they started – RuneCraft running businesses. Now, I don't know if, if this is who you ran for, but um, we here at RSBNB, myself and Mike, ran for a person named Larry R. Does that ring any bells to you? Oh, yeah. And it should for anyone that played uh, back in the day. Exactly. Um, yeah. So Larry R was the first... Uh, person to you know have a lot of room crafting xp um contrary to popular belief larry r did not get uh 99 room crafting first the first person to get 99 room crafting was kale still that happened um in 2004 and larry r eventually passed kale still and larry r continued to room craft to uh, a point of high xp before disappearing in the community but larry I R's... it was just above 150 mil 157 or wow. something ring okay above. yeah so that would have been north of 120 by even today's standards then right yeah absolutely yep and keep in mind this was all done with a conventional rune crafting altar no zmi altar no rune spend, and certainly no metaphor soul runes. So this no. was slow rune crafting. Oh, and no, no abyss as well. Right. So uh, this was very early days for RS2. And this, you know, when I say skills I'd like to see in game, I would love to see a skill in game that is as slow as rune crafting was back then. Just to have something where it takes people a few months to get to 99, but I don't think, I don't think the community would tolerate that today. No, no um, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, so a bunch of us from RSBNB uh, would run uh, Nature's for Larry R because it was a good way of getting money at the time. You know, you spend an hour or two and you can come away with some GP. And um, also back then, uh, one of the rewards for running Nature's with Larry R was a glory amulet, which back in the day was a good way to get around and still very expensive with RS2. So um, there were there were lots of benefits for doing this. And the point I wanted to bring up is that two of the very prominent RSBNB community, community members, Pika, the first host of this podcast, and Jeremy99, Jer99, um, are two of the people that we met running RuneCrafting and brought them um, over to RSBNB. Eventually, we stopped with this and um, Larry R. disappeared. But, um, you know, there, there, there was a... There was a essence of community about it, and we brought some of the early RSBNB community members to Larry R. And at the same time, we also met some people from Larry R. who came over to the RSBNB community at that time. So, um, yeah, lots of things happened uh, with that, and it was all in all a good experience. And um, the reason I wanted to bring it up is because of Larry R.'s disappearance, um, but at the same time. Um, you don't really see this anymore in RuneScape, this kind of community involvement like this at such a massive level. Um, there were lines that were, you know, often 20 plus people line long in, in order to try and get to the runecrafting altar to uh, trade essence and whatnot, right? So. Oh, yeah. No, I like to refer to it as sort of the, uh, the golden age of uh, RS because that was back when – you know, there was no such, there was no grand exchange. Everything was ruled by the forums, um, or you know, just World Two sort of marketplace, just typing out all your favorite chat effects and whatnot. But uh, no, I, I mean, it, the same with nature running uh, holds true for cannonball businesses. Um, I actually was involved in a couple of those um, early when I first started in 2004, 2005, and I actually made quite a bit of money um, doing that and exchanging bars for. Uh, for cannonballs, and I even was a part of a uh, sort of a fle fletching um, 
operation where you know it basically we we would just give people free fletching experience. You know, we would, we would give them, uh, you know, 2000 logs and they would give us 2000 bows or 2000 strung bows or whatever. So, I mean, it was not necessarily paying them financially, but we were basically just training their, um, training their fletching for them. And then we would go and sell what they made to, you know, people that would high alk it. And we sort right. of had a, you know, production chain going. So yeah, I, I really do miss that sort of aspect of it because, um, it actually taught me quite a bit about how economics work and supply and oh, demand. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was, it was fun about it for sure. Definitely. So. And, you know, that's the, you made money with runecrafting or runecraft running because you would get a certain amount of GP to run to the Karamda General Store and you would right. get to keep the surplus. And that's where the money came from. So, um, and, you know, we were very early in. This was, we did this running when Larry R still did the actual trading. Later on, there were assistants hired and Larry, right, Larry right. would just stay in the, in the runecraft altar. So we were in very, very early on this. So, yeah, but, um, I'll include the player wiki link to that. There's a RS players wiki, uh, that, uh, provides information on all these players and, Looks like looks like Pika was right back in the day. Um, Pika did know that Larry R was actually uh, played by uh, a mother, and it was her son who got her got her into the game. So the RS Wiki does have that and did cor- corroborate Pika's story. Pika back in the day was fo- was fond of telling stories that could be seen as uh, bending the truth or pulling people's <laughs> legs. So I'm glad this one was indeed true. So. All right. So, yeah, there's there's the two things that were for another show, and I didn't time that, and now you see why I say that's a topic for another <laughs> show. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So, if you guys want to submit your own questions, uh, update.rsbnb.com slash ask. Unknown if we'll be doing questions next week. Our RuneFest schedule is kind of in flux. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see on that. Um but uh, update.rsbnb.com slash ask or on Twitter at RSBNB, direct message them to us. Or if you prefer to use your phone, 571-57BNB, which is 571-572-2632. All right. Tech news time. Big week in tech news this week. Big week. So, Apple... You interested in this new phone? Uh, it caught my attention. Uh, nothing too crazy uh, in my eyes, but uh, that's definitely subjective. Okay. So this week, Apple announced the iPhone X. And before people start calling it the iPhone X, it is the iPhone X. It is the 10th anniversary of iPhone. So I want to highlight that, that it should be called the iPhone X. Um, they did also announce the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 8 Plus. But the iPhone X is... Basically, what Apple is saying is the most innovative t- iPhone that they've ever uh, created, though they do say that every year. And this year it is kind yeah. of the case because uh, this one has no physical buttons on the front of it that you press. Um, the device is entirely controlled by gestures, and they got rid of the fingerprint sensor and uh, and elected to go with facial recognition this time. So basically, this new iPhone ten. Um, is a 5.8 inch display and it is an OLED display. So it's going to have super bright and super vibrant colors with it. And along with that, um, it's going to be very thin as well. So this in a way is basically what they're saying. This is what the next generation of iPhone is going to look like. And it's all screen edge to edge, except for a little notch out of the top that houses the sensors, the camera, the speaker, uh, the true depth camera, they're calling it, that uses the face ID technology. Um, you know, I kind of think that the notch takes a little bit away from this, maybe. But I guess they would have needed a spot to put the camera, wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, I don't know how they do it on other devices, but um, um, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sold on the notch. What do you think? No, I think uh, it's kind of one of those things that I know it sort of... Irritate. I don't want to say irritates me, but it definitely catches my eye, uh, but not in the uh, the good sense of it. I think it, if, you know, kind of all or nothing. With with all the innovation they claim to do, you'd think they'd be able to uh, come up with something to not have something just sort of 
stare you in the face. No pun intended. So yeah, yeah. But I don't know where the camera would have went then. I mean, they could have right. put a smaller bezel on top, but maybe maybe this is seen as in the design aesthetic the best way to go. Um, as I said, gestures to access home, you know, single swipe up takes you back to the home screen. Um, you know, and I do have a little bit of a concern with that from the usability perspective, because for 10 years now you've had a button that you press to take you home on the iPhone and it's just been so simple. But at the same time, I also love the fact that there are no buttons on the device, which is absolutely amazing. And I think we've been going a long time to get to an Apple device like that. I mean, just look at the one button mice. And I'm not saying that to to knock the one button mice. I think if you can have one button and still be um and still be uh efficient with it, that's the best way to go. Yeah. So um but this uh, notch up top includes an IR camera, a flood illuminator, a proximity sensor, a light sensor, the speaker the forward facing camera and the dot projector, which is of course the main way that they use facial uh, ID face ID. It projects dots onto your screen or onto your face and measures the distance from them and um, ensures that it's uh, getting a portrait, an accurate 3d portrait of your face so it can unlock it. Um, There have been questions asked, you know, what happens if someone tries to steal your device and shine it in your face to to (laughs) unlock it? Um, They said there's an option you can enable so that um, you have to have direct eye contact with the device rather than just glancing at it, which, I mean, it, it, if it's being stolen from you, that's that's not what you're going to be thinking about, I think. Right. Um, another thing Apple said is you can press the buttons on either side of the device and that disables Face ID and requires a, requires a passcode. But once again, what if someone just grabs the device out of your hand, right? No. So, uh, I mean... Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, I, we'll have to wait and see what the initial impressions are with this. And I think the biggest thing that uh, we haven't mentioned so far is that this device doesn't go on for pre-order until the end of October and ships the first week of November because of uh, limited supply constraints. So um, it it's definitely going to be something that people are going to wait to get, and it could very well end up being a, a collector's item because I foresee them changing the design next year to maybe reduce the size of the notch and also add the fingerprint sensor to it because that's something they wanted to do this year, but they weren't available to. So um, this one starts at nine ninety nine US, which off contract, I mean, it's up to you if you're going to spend something like that, right? So yeah. Um, also they did come out with the iPhone eight and the iPhone eight plus. Now all three of these iPhones have the same camera. Um, the larger one does have the second camera enabling the photo mode that was talked about last year. They all have the same CPU and they all have wireless charging, which is something that people didn't think Apple would do, but they did. So I don't know. I I think it's kind of neat that you can charge a device by just resting it on a charging pad. So, yeah, no, I really like that feature. And what's more is that Apple's charging mat is not available till next year. So the third party chat charging mats that are already available work for all these devices. Yep. So that that's pretty big of Apple to do that. So I I think they had a good announcement this year with these and uh, we'll just have to wait and see uh, what the general response is specifically to the iPhone 10. Um, I think the iPhone 8 and the 8 Plus will, you know, be hits out of the park because they're just iterations on the iPhone 7. So um, overall, it looks pretty good. Um, is it, would this be enough to entice you back at some point to uh, look at Apple again? Maybe uh, one year for I, 10? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it definitely catches my eye, catches my attention. Um, I don't know about making me swing completely back to the other side, but I think it's definitely worth... Um, you know, if not a chance, at least a closer look. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and you know, one thing they demonstrated on stage that I don't know if it was right for them to do this or if this was a good way to show seriousness of the product. Uh, they demonstrated their new Animoji technology, which allows you to animate emojis based on your facial expressions. So they animated the pony emoji and the poop emoji. <laughs> We're talking cutting edge technology here, folks. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be able to send those in messages to your friends. 
There you go. Anyways, uh, iPhone 8 starts at $699 US and Plus is $799. Also along with this, they released a Series 3 Apple Watch with optional LTE connectivity so it can be unpaired from your phone, which is something people uh, might like. And they also released a 4K Apple TV. And here's perhaps one of the biggest announcements uh, from this is you remember a few weeks ago we were talking about movie rentals, right? And how the prices for 4K rentals could be a few dollars more, up to $5 more, right? Right, yeah. Well, Apple has been able to get a deal where prices on the iTunes rental stores are going to stay the same for 4K content. And if Hmm. you own any 4K content... Through iTunes, it'll automatically get up, or sorry, any 1080p content, it'll automatically get updated to 4K for free. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, we see all these uh, game consoles, you know, the PS4 Pro, the Xbox One X coming out with uh, 4K Ultra HD Blu ray players, right? Yeah. And at the same time, Blu ray discs like that are $25 to $35. Whereas now, you don't need to upgrade your movies if you purchased a bunch of movies last year. You just get a 4K Apple TV and you have all of your 4K content available to you that you already own. So here we are seeing the benefits of digital uh, compared to where we were at before with these. So um, I, I think this is a very positive thing to say the least uh, that they're doing here. So, um, Oh, and we also did talk about the Disney uh, streaming service last month. Disney is the only is the only studio not offering their movies for this option, which makes sense because they want to start their own streaming service. So, right, um, that's kind of unfortunate, though. But, anyways, it is what it is. Um, anything else on the Apple stuff? I don't think we missed nope. anything. No, iOS eleven and WatchOS four come out on Tuesday. And Mac OS High Sierra comes out on the 25th of September if you're a Mac user. So I'm going to be doing my podcast this weekend. Then I need to update to the gold master of High Sierra because I have to make sure all the software and stuff works. So we're not in the middle of a week without a recording setup. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, so that's Apple's announcements for this week. We're going to move over to the EU right now and talk a little bit about Google and their... uh, lawsuit with the European Trade Commission. Um, Google has filed an appeal to their $2.7 billion fine in the EU. Uh, This uh, related to the illegal advertising or so the EU said regarding this. Uh, Reading from the article here, it says, quote, Google has filed a legal appeal against a record-breaking fine handed down by the European Commission this summer for anti-competitive behavior relating to the operation of its product search comparison service, currently known as Google Shopping. Uh, So back in June, the European Commission ruled that Google had given its own shopping service, quote, an illegal advantage by abusing its dominance in general internet search. The commission issued a $2.4 billion euro fine, which is about $2.7 billion dollars. U.S. Google's ultimately hopeful that they will be successful uh, since earlier this month, a similar but different case involving Intel was referred to review by the European top court. Google is also playing uh, the game. Since last month, they took some first steps to comply with the EU Commission's antitrust order against Google Shopping by submitting details on how it intends to amend the price comparison service. It ultimately takes some time to reach a final verdict because on average it takes between 18 months and two years for a final judgment on issues like this to be handed down. So, um, you know, I'm of, I'm of two minds on this. I think, I think it's good that Google is complying with this and moving forward and in general, um, listening to the feedback that is offered by the EU But at the same time, we need to look at Google for what it is and realize that Google is, in effect, a search monopoly. Because how many people do you know who use Bing? Uh, People that don't know any better. I'll just say that. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it comes down to using Bing as a protest or maybe it's, you know, because of some feature on your device or whatnot. Or maybe you have a full Microsoft stack integration or something like that. Right. 
But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, Google is a monopoly for search. And if they're being looked at as a monopoly for the shopping service, then maybe they should also be looked at as a monopoly for um, for search as well. But on the flip side of this, there's an argument to be made that there's consumer choice, that when you sign up to use Google, you are signing in with that Google account optionally, but it's encouraged that you are getting a Google experience based on the websites you go to, based on what you search for, based right. on what your interests are. And it's entirely possible for you to not use Google search as a, as an option out there and to realize that there is indeed a difference between a placement of an ad versus a placement of an actual, um, uh, I guess, third-party service. Like, for example, Google already does this with some of their service, like with their flight tracker, for example. If you're if you're looking to buy tickets to somewhere, you basically punch in the information regarding your flights. And if you just, um, you know, pop something in here, it will say you can book it with this provider, but note that this is perhaps a sponsored agreement. So it is listed there, and there is some due diligence on the part of the consumer, right? So it doesn't yeah. it doesn't always just come down to that we're gonna we're gonna do that we're gonna do that. So and it says ads like there's a little exclamation point here. It says Google may be compensated by some of these providers, which is something that's right out there. And I'm sure if you go to the shopping page. You will see the same thing. I don't know. What could we just search for right now as a shopping example, Dave? Um, I don't know. Computer parts. Okay. Or maybe even a video card. Video card, yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, um, gearbeast.com is the first thing that came up here. And it says that, you know, this is an ad. So, I mean, it's quite clear that it's there. But at the same time, I think it might be going more into the... uh, shopping service but nonetheless uh, right i don't know it it can go either way and i think both sides have good arguments here and um i think google has a good argument i think the eu has a good argument and um it ultimately should get come down to user choice so all righty anything else on that one So you might have been hearing of a major security vulnerability when it comes to Equifax. And this is largely an exclusive American story here because Equifax is a company that operates in the U.S., I think, primarily. And basically what happened here is that uh, this past week they said that the vulnerability that caused um, lots of information to be lost from up to 143 million people in the U.S., including names, social security numbers, birth dates, and addresses of these customers were lost because of a security vulnerability. They identified this as coming from an obscure Apache Struts vulnerability that was first identified on March 6th. It wasn't acted on until much later than that. So the vulnerability allows for an unauthenticated remote code execution on the server. Further, there there were at least two known public exploits for this vulnerability, and ISPs is already starting seeing scanning and exploits for these against some campus computer systems when this was reported. So there was no reason for Equifax to face this because this was this was on March sixth. And Equifax learned about the breach on the 29th of July. So there was a clear security issue at Equifax regarding this. And they, of course, you know, going through legal matters and whatnot, they didn't tell uh, the public about it until just a couple weeks ago. So, I mean, this is the, this is the risk that people have online, I think, um, that companies have online when they don't take their security seriously. Because this software that's publicly available that runs much of the internet can have a security vulnerability in it. And if it's not patched, companies like this become vulnerable. And it's up to those companies to have a reliable 
uh, security system and IT security infrastructure in place to ensure this kind of stuff doesn't happen for these common vulnerabilities like this. Um, it's really quite disturbing that it was something so common and something that had been patched. So there's going to be lots to talk about in Equifax with this. So um, I hope you didn't use them or anything like that. No, no, <laughs> but, absolutely not. Um, so if you're in the U.S., just be aware of this this happened and Equifax could have prevented it. We'll have to see what kind of uh, ramifications they face for it going forward. But um, this is never going to be good for PR like this, especially when it comes to a credit monitoring service company. So, um, and you know, just as a general um, advisement to people out there who are uh, in the security industry or might be concerned about their security, this is the number one reason to run software updates accordingly and run it all the time. So, definitely run your software updates on your computers and devices when you have the option to do so. All righty. Uh, ready for skill of the month update? I'm ready. Okie dokie. So the skill of the month is summoning. Uh, we have seen sub movement. Parnassi is still in first place with 1.2 million XP gained. Jam Andy 52 with 680k and Desmo 360 now in third with 215,000 XP gained. But as I said, it is double XP weekend, so anything is possible with this, and I am entirely expecting leads to change over the weekend. So uh, ignore what you're hearing right now if you're listening to this before double XP weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You have any summoning plans this weekend? Nope. It's uh, any summoning, or at least work towards it, will be uh, from my final drops from Slayer that I will be going from 119 to 120. So nothing actively training uh, summoning, though. Okie dokie. Well, um, before we get on to achievements, I'll just like to remind everyone that Informer is looking for new writers. So if you want to write about RuneScape or even just writing, uh, get in contact with us. Write an article about something RuneScape related that's 500 to 1,000 words long, preferably about your favorite RuneScape subject or actually anything RuneScape related will work. And if we like what we see, we'll get in contact with you about writing on a monthly basis. Uh, it's pretty good. You get to choose your deadlines. You get to choose what you write about. You get to choose if you do a series or if you just do one-off articles. Um, it's pretty good. And you get to come on update from time to time as well. So if you want to uh, send any of these in, you just basically write it, uh, proofread it, and send it to me on the forums, rsbnb.com slash forums. Or you can email it to us at shane at rsbnb.com. Shane at rsbnb.com. All right. Let's do some achievements before we the got quite, calm before the storm. Yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, achievements of the week. Uh, we got a few here. We got Touchpad Pro with 120 Divination on the 13th. Uh, we got Magic King with 99 Mining on uh, the 11th. Uh, Quest Lore with 99 Magic on the 10th. Uh, and then we got Jamandi uh, 52, 200 mil fishing XP uh, on September 9th. So that's uh, that's super awesome. I love seeing the 200 mils on there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, next up, we have Desmo 360 with 99 Hunter on the 9th. Continuing on the 9th, we have Cabrew with 120 Slayer. Eve Shaba with 99 Magic on the 8th. Chodo 3000 with one... I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Not 120 <laughs> Farming. You're going to get there eventually. But 99 farming on September 7th. See, always want people to be getting that 120 farming. Oh, yeah. And now Parnassius with 120 magic on September 7th. So there we go. All right. Good achievements. And as I said, calm before the storm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, pick of the week. You, you uh, elected me to do a pick of the week, so I'm going to do that yes. for you. So... Our solar system, it's pretty big. Um, and, you know, I don't think we really appreciate how big the solar system is. So what this website does is it puts together a, what they're calling a really realistic map of the solar system. It says, if the moon were only one pixel, so if the moon were only one pixel big on your screen, i.e. a little dot, what would the solar system look like? So you can scroll through it here, and you see the sun, and then you see nothing. You see nothing. You keep scrolling. We're over 5 million kilometers away. 
10 million kilometers away. Nothing, 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 nothing. And I'm just, I'm, and I'm just scrolling along here. I'm just scrolling along, scrolling along, scrolling along, 50 million kilometers away from the sun. Mercury, a tiny, tiny, tiny little dot showing where Mercury is. We can scroll a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So much more, so much more. Up to 108 million, X, 108 million kilometers away. Almost said XP there. <laughs> Venus, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Halfway to Earth. Halfway. Earth. And, and the moon. Oh my God, we're finally there. 150 million kilometers away. So, and it's worth noting that I haven't been scrolling slow. I've been flicking my trackpad as we go. And we're not even at Mars yet. <laughs> that is how big the solar system is. And we're at the inner planets right now. We're 220 million kilometers away. 228. And we just hit Mars. So you can keep scrolling and you can keep scrolling all the way through this, all the way through this, and you're going to get to the gas giants and the amount of space between the planets is just going to increase because as you go further out in the solar system, you might not realize it, but the spacing between planets in the solar system increases as we move out to the gas giants. So at Mars, we're at 231 million kilometers away. Now, if we go all the way to Jupiter, oh my, <laughs> it, <laughs> it jumps out to 782 million kilometers away from the sun. Now compare that with Mars. Mars is only 231 million kilometers away from the sun. So the distance from Jupiter to Mars, or sorry, from Jupiter to Mars, yeah, is almost double the distance between Mars and the sun. Wow. And when you, you just keep clicking through these, Jupiter, 782 million. Saturn, all the way going, all the way past this, 1.4 million kilometers away and change. Next up, Uranus. Keep going. Keep going. 2.8 million kilometers away and change. Neptune. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Near the end. 4.5 million kilometers away. And then Pluto's on here, but we know Pluto's not really a planet anymore. <laughs> Pluto. 5.9 million kilometers away. Billion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I missed that order of magnitude change right there. <laughs> I missed it. Oh, and Neptune was billion as well. You're right. I missed the order of magnitude change. Uranus was, ne was billion as well. So you can see just how big the solar system is out here. And it's got a really sobering fact at the end of this. That if you click on this, it says, might as well stop now. We would need to scroll through another 6,771 more maps like this before we see anything else. Mm, it's equally as terrifying. Or yep. is it? I mean. Tis the question. Yeah, that is, that's where we're at. So then if you just want to see what it was, you just click back to the sun and you get a trip back all through the solar system and imagining you could go through it all this way back. So um, this is at, uh, this was made by a fellow named um, Josh Worth, and it's at joshworth.com, but um, probably kind of hard to find there. So I'll just put a link in the show notes to that website. You can find that at update.rsbnb.com. It's also um, interesting that you can, um, change the units on here to kilometers, miles, astronomical units, AUs, light minutes. So if you click Earth, you'll see um, 
how many minutes the sun takes to get there. And it is uh, eight and a half minutes for that to uh, that light to reach the sun. And if you go to Mars, that jumps up accordingly uh, to 12.9 minutes. And then if we jump all the way out to Neptune, you can see that the sun that uh, emits itself, it takes 250 light minutes to get there. So that meant if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 250 minutes to get to Neptune. So... That's a, that's a little sobering thought of how big the solar system is. And then you can imagine that there are all these other solar systems out there and all the other galaxies out there. And you get an idea of how big the universe is. So would definitely re re recommend everyone have a look at that if you want to see how large uh, the universe is compared to where we are. It's a little dot, a little pixel of Earth. So. The what infamous you... pale blue dot. Yep. What have you been up to this week? Uh, well, as uh, pretty much the same as last week, just ready for the calm before the storm. Uh, I think we're we're less than what twelve hours now, getting close to less than twelve hours for the uh, the drop to hit. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna hopefully hit the ground running uh, tomorrow after work, and uh, hopefully not gonna look back. So that's uh, just kind of been mentally preparing myself. So. Alrighty. Um, as for me this week, uh, same thing, preparing, um, getting some invention stuff ready, might do some electrified box traps. I don't know if anyone has any experience with those, but, um, they, they seem to be worth it. I think, I don't know. You have any experience with those since you I do not, unfortunately. Okay. No. Right. Um, but aside from that, uh, I'm going to be doing my protein stuff and invention stuff. Also, I got some blueprints saved up. Um, but beyond that, um, I think what we're going to see for the weekend is going to be probably – it's going to be lots of Herblar. I got over 5,000 potions waiting to be made, so that will be a good chunk of it. Um, I got over 1,000 protein items waiting to be done. They will be done as traps. And after that, blueprints and probably just sitting at my Ark Island doing some invention stuff – Leveling up the uh, uh, fishing rods and axes to uh, get a jump on the new invention stuff that comes out because I think I think it'll be time to finally train invention for me after yeah, this. There you go. So, um, a couple of interesting things this week happened. Uh, RS wise, if I just go to my little folder here of uh, uh, rewards, if I look at this here, um, I got. A clue scroll this week that was worth 4.8 million uh, GP based on the value that was associated with it. But once I actually uh, cashed it in, it was three Ceridoman pages. It came out to be more like 5.6 million GP because of just how much uh, emphasis people are placing on those. So always good to do clue scrolls. So and that one wasn't even with the luck of the dwarves ring. Uh, oh, it didn't boy. shine for that. So. It was some pretty lucky stuff on its own. So that was me this week on RuneScape. And with that being said, everyone have a good double XP weekend. And we'll be back next week to talk about invention and RuneFast. So see you then. See ya. See ya.